Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the effects of weight training on blood pressure control. As you guys know, I am very much interested in cardiovascular disease prevention, and a, a cornerstone of that is control of blood pressure. If you look at some of the large population studies out there, Framingham, for example, hypertension is actually a, a more significant cardiac risk factor than uh, elevated cholesterol levels. Now, they're both obviously quite important. And if your goal is to live into your 90s or maybe even make it to 100 one day, those are both two areas that you need to keep very, very close tabs on. There are a lot of really good uh, resources out there for clinicians who manage uh, hypertension on a regular basis like I do. Um, and uh, the one that I like the best is this uh, relatively new 2023 European Society of Hypertension Guidelines uh, for the Management of Arterial Hypertension. And this came out in the Journal of uh, Hypertension back in December 2023. It's it's not too much different from other guidelines that have been published in the past by the American College of Cardiology or the American Heart Association. But uh, I think it's the, the European guidelines are they're particularly well laid out, and I just like the way the the paper is structured. It talks about how to manage, you know, both routine hypertension and then hypertension in special populations, people that have, um, you know, specific more serious medical issues. So it's a, it's a great paper. If you're a clinician, I strongly recommend you go go check it out. It's an open access uh, journal that you can get. Just do a quick Google search, and uh, and you will find it. This is one of the charts from that from that paper that I I want to address with you guys before we start getting into the the nitty gritty of what I want to talk about today in terms of the effects of weight training. I think it's just a good idea to keep in mind, you know, what what actually constitutes high blood pressure and and why have they chosen the numbers that they've chosen because they have changed over the years. I know they're quite different when I started my medical career uh, over twenty years ago, but. Typically, um, hypertension is defined as a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 140 over 90. And most of the guidelines out there will recommend some sort of pharmacological intervention at that point. Uh, although certainly it uh, can be started earlier than that in people that have other comorbidities, so chronic kidney disease, cardiac disease, et cetera. I'm not going to get too much into that today. I might save that for another time if you guys are interested in and a long deep dive into hypertension, I'd be happy to do that for you. Um, but that's what's considered grade one hypertension. Now, um, that's kind of a no-brainer in my opinion, but the question in my mind has always been, okay, well, what is what is the optimal blood pressure? If we're really interested in longevity, which is what, I, what I'm interested in, obviously, I know if I want to live into my 90s or you know even make it to 100, as I stated before, you know what? What should my blood pressure be right now? the The bulk of the data seems to su suggest that an optimal blood pressure is an average throughout the day of somewhere under one hundred and twenty um, over eighty. So one hundred and twenty over eighty or less is where you should be. And you know the reason for that is there's been a number of large clinical trials over the years that have looked at the rates of these adverse cardiac events, things like heart attacks, strokes, etc. And when you start getting above 120 over 80, we start seeing an uptick in these adverse cardiac events. And they really start, you know, they really start going up after uh, 140 over 90, which is why they use that as a grade one hypertension uh, threshold. So, it, you know, that's caused a lot of consternation and frustration, both among clinicians and among patients, because, you know, the what I hear all the time is like, well, n nobody can achieve that without medications. And I, I understand that argument. And yeah, the, the, that's that's probably a true statement. The majority of people in the Western world who live a Western lifestyle, who eat a Western diet are probably, unless they're genetically fortunate, are probably not going to be able to achieve you know, sustained blood pressures for the bulk of their adult life at one at less than 120 over 80. They, obviously, there may be some that, that can do that. But the fact of the matter is that most people also are unwilling to do the things that they need to do in order to get down, get their blood pressure down that low, which often, you know, requires radical uh, decreases in body weight, uh, sodium restriction. Without going too far down the rabbit hole, I mean, there there is a very strong association between sodium intake and blood pressure. 
that's really beyond the point of debate at this point. However, uh, not everybody has salt sensitive hypertension. Okay, this is largely a genetically mediated trait. It does seem to get worse with age. It's probably related to the ability, you know, an individual's ability to excrete a, a sodium load when they get, you know, a bolus of sodium from their diet. How well do they handle that? How quickly are they able to get rid of that excess salt? It has a lot to do with uh, how their blood pressure is going to respond after, um, you know, a given amount of sodium. So, yeah, th there are people that. Um, that can get away with eating a lot of salt. And thankfully, I'm one of them because I love salt. I put salt on everything. And um, thankfully, it doesn't really seem to skew my blood pressure very much. But at the same time, there are also people on the other end of the spectrum who are extremely salt sensitive, and they benefit greatly by following sort of a DASH type diet that has a relatively low amount of sodium in it. So just keep in mind, you know, a, a lot of that is genetic and it is age driven um, as well. But again, you know, most people these days, quite frankly, are just not willing to do some of the things that they're going to need to do in order to get their blood pressure that low. And yeah, so in those, in those instances, uh, yeah, there, you know, a medication is probably going to be needed to get under 120 over 80. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. That's just, just the way it is these days. Now, having said that, just because you are over, you know, running around over 120 over 80, does, again, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to be on medication. Um, there, they, these guidelines and all of, all of the major guidelines heavily em emphasize diet and lifestyle interventions. So, um, you know, again, weight loss, treating underlying uh, causes that could be contributing or underlying conditions, I should say, that can contribute to hypertension. Sleep apnea is a huge one. That there are many people that can come off of antihypertensives or lower their doses of their antihypertensives just by um, addressing their sleep apnea. So extremely, extremely important. So anyway, I don't want to get you know too far into the weeds on on that. We'll get into the meat and potatoes here in in just a moment. The the final thing I want to mention is um, I do think it's important that you track your blood pressures at home. Um, in addition to getting them checked in your doctor's office, and there is a proper way to check your blood pressure, uh, which none of us do. I, I'm guilty of this as well, and quite frankly, even in the clinics, nobody does this. So this is a uh, a diagram here from the European guidelines, and it walks you through the steps of um, how to do a proper blood pressure reading, whether it's in the clinic or whether it's at your home. So the first thing is they want you to use a validated automatic um, electronic upper arm cuff, so not a wrist cuff. I, I personally don't have an issue if you want to use a wrist cuff. Keep in mind that they may not be as accurate as, um, as an upper arm cuff. And if you're interested in, you know, what constitutes a validated automatic uh, cuff? Well, you can go to this website. It's called stridebp.org. I'll put a link to it in the show, in the show notes. And they have done independent testing, and, and they'll give you a list of what they consider to be, quote, validated blood pressure um, monitors that you can buy for the home. And they have some for uh, medical use as well. So if it's on that list, it's probably it's probably pretty accurate. So number two, quiet room with comfortable temperature, no smoking, caffeine, food, uh, or drug intake, uh, or exercise 30 minutes before measurement. Seems pretty obvious. Uh, remain seated and relaxed for three to five minutes. No talking uh, during or between measurements. You have to sit with your back supported by a chair, legs uncrossed, both, both feet flat on the floor, bare arm resting on the table at about cardiac level, about the level of your heart. And then they're in the office, they say, take three readings with one minute intervals between the readings and use the average of the last two. And then at home, they, it's different. You take two readings with one minute intervals between, and then you just use the average. Now you tell me, like, how often, when you go to the doctor's office, how often does that happen? Uh, never. It, th that has never happened in my entire medical career, uh, uh, either you know, as a, both as a physician and as a patient. Um, the last time I was at the VA, it's not a knock on the VA because all clinics are like this. They they rush you in, you sit down, um, they slap the cuff on you, hit the button, and then as the blood pressure is being taken, they're interviewing you. The 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 nurse or the medical aide is taking some quick history, you know, why are you here? Are these the current meds you're on? Blah, blah, blah. And then uh, they get one reading, they write it down. Um, and, uh, you know, then they leave and the doctor comes in and you have your visit. So 
Keep in mind that according to the European guidelines, and actually you know, according to all of the major guidelines out there, that is not a proper way to take a blood pressure. So when you're at home, at least, you, you should hopefully be able to conform to this procedure and do things in, in a proper way. And that's considered to be a, a you know, an adequate blood pressure, a reliable blood pressure. Um, you don't want to take it, obviously, when you've just been screaming at your kids or you are just had a fight with your spouse or, you know, whatever. You want to be in a nice, calm state, ideally in a quiet, cool environment where you're comfortable. And those are the readings that you should be recording. So anyway, having said that, why is it important to keep track of your blood pressure. So it damages multiple vital organs. So typically we think about the heart, so it can lead to something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a thickening of the heart. The heart has to work much harder to push against what we call afterload. So it thickens up and eventually that can lead to heart failure. And there's different kinds of heart failure that are beyond the scope of this talk, but congestive heart failure, a major risk factor for the development of congestive heart failure is uh, chronic uncontrolled hypertension, just like the development of chronic kidney disease. So, you know, you hear a lot about um, some of these retired professional bodybuilders. Some of them are now on dialysis. Some of them have chronic kidney disease. You know, it's a good bet that a large number of those guys had very high uncontrolled uh, blood pressures probably for decades. And that's the thing about hypertension is it does its damage. It doesn't do its damage acutely. It does its damage chronically over months and years and years and years, which is why as an aside, you know, you don't need to come to the emergency department just because you see an elevated blood pressure reading on a home blood pressure cuff, or if you go to Walmart and you get your blood pressure taken there and it says 210 over 100 and you otherwise feel fine, you don't need to come to the emergency department. So please don't do that. Uh, but you do need to be seen by your regular doctor. That blood pressure does need to come down. It just doesn't need to come down emergently. So, and that's assuming, again, you're asymptomatic. Uh, obviously, if you're having crushing chest pain, if you're short of breath, if uh, you can't move one side of your body, you're slurring your speech, etc., you have the sudden worst headache of your life, um, among other things, absolutely, that's a different story. Please come to the emergency department and get yourself checked out. But in general, just because you see an elevated reading, uh, you're not going to stroke out that night. Okay, you can you know, that that's a visit that um, with your doctor that can happen in even in a few days. All right, let's talk about the effects of, of weight training. Um, you know, exercise in general has benefits uh, in, in terms of lowering blood pressure chronically. And both aerobic exercise and uh, resistance exercise are both associated with drops in, in blood pressure. So this is a, an article here from uh, nature.com, Scientific Reports. This was done... What was this one? Yeah, 2023. So fairly recent. It's a meta-analysis, strength training for arterial hypertension treatment, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials. So we'll talk about the chronic effects here briefly, but what's really cool and interesting is this next study after this, I'm going to show you guys, or um, you, I'm going to show you guys what happens to your blood pressure while you're at the gym lifting weights. I think it will, the numbers will shock some of you, I think. But getting back to the chronic effects. So this particular paper reviewed uh, 14 studies, 253 subjects, and not surprisingly, they noticed sustained and significant post-exercise reductions in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, to, get the, to get the minimum effect from this, they said that you had to train at a you know, relatively high intensity. So they said at least training at at least 60% of your one rep max, you did not have to train to failure, and it needs to occur at least, at least twice a week. So that's kind of the bare bones minimum to get the benefit of um, of weight training on your blood pressure. So 60% of one rep max and at least twice a week. And in this particular study, um, the average or the mean uh, drop in systolic blood pressure was, was 8.6, um, which is pretty impressive. And in the diastolic blood pressure, it was actually up to 9.5. Now that was in, in the young group. So if you're young, and they define young as age 18 to 50, um, you, you got a fairly substantial drop in diastolic blood pressure, but it was only 4.1 if you were over the age of 50, which kind of makes sense. Your diastolic blood pressure, you know, diastole is a period of time where the heart is relaxed and it's filling, and that's where the um, blood, uh, your blood vessel wall, which has just, you know, expanded with 
cardiac contraction is now relaxing. Well, you know, your arteries and uh, both large arteries and small arteries, they get a little bit stiffer as you get older. They get calcified and they don't bounce back. They're not quite as elastic as they used to be. So, it, you know, it makes sense that an older individual is not going to get the same amount of uh, reduction in their diastolic blood pressure as a younger person would. Now, the, these numbers are quite impressive. I mean, an 8.6 drop in systolic and uh, between four and nine and a half for diastolic is is quite impressive. It's it's a bit higher than I've seen in other studies. Um, most of the other studies that I've seen on this have shown a little bit more modest decreases. So somewhere between like five and eight millimeters of mercury for systolic and somewhere between like four and five for diastolic, which is still quite significant, especially if you stack it with um, aerobic exercise, if you stack it with weight loss, which can have a major effect. And then again, if you have salt sensitive uh, hypertension, if you limit your sodium intake, sometimes that that combination can be enough to you know help you avoid being on blood pressure medicine. So, um, so strength training. There's so many there's so many good reasons for you to to strength train uh, for longevity. But this is just yet another benefit is 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 these sustained blood pressure reductions. You just have to stay consistent with it. You have to do you do have to train relatively hard, um, and you have to do it a minimum of at least two weeks to get to get the benefit. At least according to this article. So, so that's all well and good. But what happens when you're actually in the gym? Okay, well, this is a, a, a really interesting paper. It's actually quite old. This is, this is a study done back in 1985. And I, I actually remember learning about this in college because I was an exercise and movement science major back in the day. So this was done in 1985. It was published by the American Physiological Society. And it's uh, entitled Arterial Blood Pressure Response to Heavy Resistance Exercise. This is this was a very hardcore. <laughs> this is a hardcore study. So they took five experienced bodybuilders who did not have hypertension. And why I say this is so hardcore is they wanted to get the most accurate blood pressure that they possibly could on these guys while they were performing various exercises to failure in the gym. So they, these guys were these were not novice lifters. These were experienced lifters, and they were lifting heavy weights all up to failure. They were basically trying to fail at about 10 reps. And the best way to get the or the most accurate blood pressure you can possibly get is the blood pressure that you obtain by inserting a catheter directly into an artery. So in this case, these five bodybuilders um, volunteered for this study and uh, had brachial uh, brachial artery catheters put in. And so this is a picture here of where the brachial artery is. And keep in mind, this is back in 1985. They didn't have ultrasound to put these in, which obviously makes it a lot easier. You can see the vessel as you go into it. I don't put in brachial artery catheters, but uh, I do do radial artery and femoral artery catheters every now and then in the emergency department. And when I, would, as a resident, when I was in the surgical and um, medical ICUs, they're they're extremely useful for critically ill patients who are on all these vaso vasoactive medications. If you really uh, want to know what's going on with somebody's hemodynamics, an arterial line is is super super helpful. But outside of that environment, I mean, in this in these kind of research studies, you're just never gonna, you're probably never gonna come across this. But um, this again, this was done back in 1985. Now the brachial artery, you can feel it if you if you palpate around between your bicep and tricep on the inner part of your arm, you'll you'll feel a pulse there, and that's that's your brachial artery. It's way deep in there. So my point is, this is a very invasive. These are arterial lines are very painful. They're very painful. And so um, kudos to these five hardcore bodybuilders that volunteered for this study because they they had these brachial artery catheters inserted and then they had to be attached to all of the equipment and monitoring that is required to get a good blood pressure while they were going to failure on a number of different lifts. And so um, they had them do uh, train to failure with uh, single arm curls. So they wanted to see what a small you know, relatively small muscle group, uh, what, what training that muscle group would do. And then they had them do leg presses and they had them do, um, leg presses with both legs. So they call that a double leg press or a single leg leg press. Um, and again, all these were taken to, uh, to muscular failure. So what do you guys think happened to their blood pressure? Super interesting. So before I show you, I want to show you guys when, when you, when you use an arterial catheter, 
you get a lot of information. And so up on the monitor in, um, if you've ever been in an ICU or an ER, um, you know, you will see, this is an example here of a, um, you know, of a cardiac monitor. So we have, you know, the rhythm strip up here in green. That's the electrical activity of the heart. You see the PQRS and T uh, complexes here. This red one here, this is, this is the arterial waveform. So to break that down for you, here's a zoom in here of it. So this, it's this red, this little red graph here. This is, this is what you see with every heartbeat. Okay. So the heart squeezes, the red line shoots up to the top. In this case, it's 120. So at the very peak there, that is what your systolic blood pressure is. And then all the way down at the bottom, before the cycle starts again, that's your diastolic blood pressure. And then this little notch here, that's when the aortic valve closes. Okay. So don't worry too much about that. But you'll see this little notch. That's just, nope, that's the aortic valve closing. And then there's something called the mean arterial pressure, which you can see measured along here. And and that's actually what, you know, in the, in the hospital, that's actually what we care about. In in the outpatient world and at home, when you're doing your blood pressure cuff, it um, it's it's not really relevant. But in this study, they looked, they, they measured mean arterial pressures. So the mean arterial pressure, it's the, it's basically the average arterial pressure throughout one cardiac cycle. So systole and then diastole, systole, diastole, and they can measure the area under the curve here. And, um, it's, uh, it can be, get quite complicated. And, uh, and anyway, that's your mean arterial pressure. And, and there's a mathematical equation for it. It's the diastolic plus one third of the pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is simply the difference between the upper and lower numbers on your on your blood pressure cuff, so your systolic and your diastolic. And anyway, you crunch the numbers, you get a mean arterial pressure. I use mean arterial pressures a lot in the emergency department with people who are critically sick, and uh, obviously in the ICU and uh, surgical ICU, that's that's really important too. But again, in the regular clinic world, it's not that important. Um, but that's what they were looking at here. So this here is a chart. This is actually what, so this is what these arterial waveforms look like. And this is just in one of the bodybuilders who's doing a, yeah, a leg press. Uh, is this double leg press? Yeah, double leg press to failure. So each one of these big curves on here, that that's a rep on the leg press. And you can see he just like failed out here at the end. Each of these little spikes in here, each one of those represents a heartbeat or a pulse or a cardiac cycle. So they uh, they measured those. So they got very good waveforms here, very accurate data um, with these uh, with these catheters. This is a chart here. Again, this is um, doing the double leg press at ninety five percent of one rep max, nine reps to failure. And what you see here with each dot, well, first of all, with, as as each rep goes along, you, you can actually see that the, the mean arterial pressures, which is the top little dots there, um, so that's the peak, and then the bottom is the, the trough for the mean pressures, and you can see like in the middle of the rep when they're pushing really hard, the mean arterial pressure is high. As they complete a rep, it goes down a little bit, and then it goes up and down, up and down. It's important to note here, as they get closer and closer to failure, as you go deeper into the set, the more reps you do, it, the the mean pressures just keep going up and up and up. And actually, they and they track with uh, with your heart rate as well. So you can see the the top one is the mean uh, mean pressures as measured by their brachial artery catheter, and the bottom is is their heart rate. So the heart rate started off. I don't know, it looks like about 80 or so, and then right at the end here, when they hit failure, these guys had heart rates. You know, it looks like probably 150 to 160 ish. It's a little bit hard to tell. What's really kind of a bit shocking if, um, if you weren't aware of this is that these guys, these guys were getting mean arterial pressures of like, on average, they were, they're peaking at like 320 over 250. So that ridiculously high mean arterial pressures. So in the middle of that, of a, of a rep, um, when they're pushing really hard, their mean arterial pressures would be up uh, at around 320. And then they complete the rep, it would go down to 250. So extraordinarily high blood pressures, right? Like you'd think these guys are going to blow an aneurysm or, you know, keel over and have a stroke, but uh, they did okay. The, 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 the highest guy, one guy got 480 over 350 for his mean arterial pressures. So like ridiculously high uh, mean arterial pressures. And here's a chart looking at 
how the different exercises stacked up against each other, uh, peak systolic and diastolic blood pressures during various exercises. It, it shouldn't be too surprising that, you know, a one arm curl done to failure is going to have, you know, lower blood pressure effects than uh, a double leg press to failure. So you can see that here on the left side, they have it at rest, obviously, which is nice and normal. And then during this one arm curl, it peaks up, but still look, I mean, these guys are getting on average, they're still getting mean, uh, they're getting blood, blood pressures like consistently over 200 millimeters of mercury. Um, a, uh, a leg press, a single leg press to failure at 95% of your one rep max was a bit higher. Not surprisingly, the double leg press with, with both legs um, done to failure was quite a bit higher. And then um, a double leg press, just a single rep, um, all out like max effort was actually a little bit less. So it's these longer sets taken to failure that result in the highest blood pressure elevations um, and obviously with big compound muscles. So, you know, presumably a squat or a deadlift, it would have been interesting to see what, what those exercises look like. I think we can probably say pretty safely that they probably were similar to the, the same blood pressure elevations as a double leg press, but we don't know for sure. It would have been, it would have been cool to see that. One of the things they noticed is in, in some of these lifts, they had these guys do a Valsalva maneuver, which is like, you know, bearing down against a closed, what they call a closed glottis. And I don't think it should come as a surprise to anybody that, you know, when you bear down like that and you're not breathing and you're, you know, exerting yourself maximally like these guys were, that you're going to get some, you know, even further elevations in blood pressure. So this is the graph here. This is what happens with, with a Valsalva maneuver. You can see they're going along. And then boom, you get the Valsalva and it goes, your, the pressures jump right back up again. You uh, exhale and then, you know, it goes back down, starts working its way up again. Another Valsalva, boom, blood pressure shoots up again and then comes down um, as well. So obviously if you hold your breath and you bear down and um, Valsalva, you're going to get a, a much higher, uh, you know, uh, you're going to get a much higher blood pressure than you would if you did not do that. So interestingly enough, just holding your breath during a lift and not doing a Valsalva per se doesn't have, it doesn't have a huge effect on blood pressure. Uh, this is a, uh, a paper talking about that here. It's in uh, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research back in 2010, Effects of Weightlifting and Breathing Technique on Blood Pressure and Heart Rate. And I'll spare you all the details here, but basically they had guys do a series of lifts, which also included a leg press, just like the other study. And they taught them how to do controlled breathing, you know, with each rep, uh, not holding their breath. And then they had them also hold their breath, but not to Valsalva. They, they said, do not bear down, do not Valsalva, just, just hold your breath during the lift and we'll see what happens. And there, you know, there was a slight increase in blood pressure in the breath holding group, but it actually was not considered statistically significant. Both groups, you know, got an elevation in blood pressure, obviously, but between holding your breath and doing a, um, you know, a structured like uh, breathing technique that they taught where you breathe, you know, in and out with each rep, um, it didn't really make much of a difference, but the Valsalva seems to make the biggest difference. Okay, so what are the ramifications of this? Well, you know, f first of all, it you know those blood pressures um, among those those five bodybuilders with the the brachial catheters. I mean, they those sound like those sound very scary and and um, and certainly uh, would sound concerning. Like you know, these guys are going to suffer, like I said, a heart attack or stroke, that sort of thing. But you know, the fact is that your arterial system, your whole cardiac system is especially when you're younger, it's designed to handle loads like that for brief periods of time. Now, you know, obviously chronically, that would be a major, major problem. There's, there's no way that um, sustained, you know, mean arterial pressures of 320 to 400 uh, would be tolerated for, you know, for days and days at a time, or let alone, you know, weeks or months, there'd be some major, major adverse effects from something like that, um, which, you know, I'm not going to get into here. However, uh, for, for short periods of time, especially if you have healthy, you know, uh, elastic blood vessels, like you do when you're younger, you know, this is something that can be well tolerated. And, and even when you're, when you're older, it can be tolerated as well. But there's a few cases where I would be a little bit concerned about these kind of blood pressures. And, you know, uh, anybody that has an intracranial aneurysm, obviously, <laughs> you know, is uh, blood pressure control is going to be acutely important for them. Um, 
And uh, I would be a little bit concerned uh, about somebody you know who has uh, has an aneurysm. And if if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, this is just a, this is an example of a arterial aneurysm, and this could be anywhere in the body, but we're talking specifically about intracranial aneurysms. And it's a weakening in the a, the wall of the artery that kind of leads to this outpocketing here. This this wall is very thin. It may be somewhat kind of friable and prone to rupture. And so this is when you hear about somebody dying of a of an aneurysm. Usually they're referring to an intracranial aneurysm, not an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Although that that's also another kind of aneurysm, um, you know, and they, they come in obviously in bad shape many times. And this is what a CT scan looks at somebody who has a non-traumatic um, intracranial aneurysm that has ruptured. This is, this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I, uh, sadly, I see these like not uncommonly. Um, this is what we call this, the starfish of death, which is this, this white material here, uh, throughout the, the brain is all, this is all blood. This is all blood. So very, very serious. And hopefully, uh, these people can get to a neuro neurosurgeon very quickly. And um, but they 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 require emergent emergent care and um, often have a very rocky road to recovery if they survive um, at all. So the 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 thing that's a little bit scary is uh, somewhere it depends on which um, data set you use, but somewhere around two to three percent of the population is walking around with an undiagnosed intracranial aneurysm. Now, that doesn't mean it's ever going to cause any problems. They might go to their grave in their 80s or 90s with that little aneurysm never having caused any issues at all. But, um, you know, certainly I would be a little bit concerned if they were routinely having these massive blood pressure spikes that over time that could potentially be an issue. So, um, so these things are out there. When you hear about young people kind of dying suddenly from aneurysms, I think there was some celebrity in the news not that long ago that had died suddenly in their in their twenties, and uh, it was from an intracranial aneurysm that ruptured. And that that's exactly what I'm talking about. These these little these little uh, defects in the arterial wall that can suddenly psh, can suddenly pop. And when when once they do, I mean, blood pressure um, manage blood pressure management is one of the crucial things that uh, physicians do when they manage somebody like this who has an aneurysm that has already ruptured. So you're trying desperately to, you know, you don't, you don't want to accelerate the hemorrhage, but at the same time, you want to maintain perfusion of the brain. It's, it's it can be very complicated. Uh, you're kind of walking a, a, a very fine edge there. So, so that's a population I'd be, I'd be a little bit concerned about. Also, People that have uh, dilated aortic roots, so the aorta is, is the huge, you know, the big main artery that comes out of your heart, pumps all of the blood to the systemic uh, circulation, and so um, you know the the root of the aorta there in some cases can can begin to dilate, and that can happen from chronic hypertension. But a lot of times there's some underlying genetic issues, some collagen uh, vascular diseases, and sometimes we don't we don't know why it happens. But one of the mainstays. If if you have an aortic root that has begun to dilate, it's not at the point where you need surgery. You know, one of the mainstays of of treatment for that is aggressive blood pressure uh, lowering and and heart rate control as well. So these guys will a lot of times end up on heavy doses of beta blockers. But there's a fair amount of the population also that's walking around with a dilated aortic root. There's a study here. Um, they did a cross sectional study of 2,317 athletes, and um, in the men. They found that 1.3% of these athletes that presented for routine examination in this study had an aortic root diameter greater than four centimeters, which is that's sort of the cutoff that we start to really worry about. So 1.3%. So that's not inconsequential, and it could potentially be higher in people who have chronic hypertension. So it's uh, it's something to think about. If I had a dilated aortic root, I'd, again, I don't know that I would want my mean arterial pressures to be shooting up into the 300s, uh, on, at least on a regular basis. I would want to be very cautious about that. So, but, you know, outside of these sorts of conditions, again, this is, this is tolerated really well. I'm not trying to tell you guys not to train hard in the gym. In fact, um, the benefits, uh, in my opinion, far outweigh the risks when, um, when it comes to strength training. So you should absolutely do it. I think you should push yourself hard in the gym. There's a, there's a number of cardiovascular benefits uh, from doing that that, again, I think outweigh any sort of short-term risk. But, you know, talk to your doctor, obviously. If you have 
chronic hypertension, if you have other conditions like chronic kidney disease, obviously if you have issues like this with your aorta, or you maybe you've had a history of an intracranial aneurysm, maybe it's been uh, coiled or surgically clipped. Um, you know, talk to your neurosurgeon about that. They may they might have some uh, some some thoughts for you on how best to manage that. So uh, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't proceed with a, a a high intensity heavy lifting program, especially if you're going to be <laughs> valsalving, which you really shouldn't do during lifts. Um, you know, you need to talk to them about that. So. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you found it, it interesting. I, I wanted to just share that study with you because I really found those those blood pressures are really impressive. And and um, I think a lot of people are unaware of exactly what happens uh, in their body while they're lifting. Again, it's not meant to dissuade you at all from heavy weight training. I think the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. So I would love to hear from you guys if you have any experience. Let me know what your doctors have told you about uh, lifting blood pressure. Let me know if you have any medical conditions that um, where you've been told that you have to watch out for things like this. And uh, I will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.